thank you all for coming on such a beautiful day uh, to this special screening of a film by Nicolas Pereda, Las Mejores Temas. And this is a film that we're seeing within this weekend focusing on new directions in contemporary world cinema, bringing together the work and uh, the, the artists responsible for them of four, four uh, extraordinary filmmakers. And the work of Nicolas Pereda is, is, is quite unusual and I think very important for many reasons, uh, for the way it deals with this question. It's oftentimes, we should say, uh, Pereda's films have been said to describe a cinema of betweenness, of in-betweenness, most often referring to his use of documentary techniques and sort of attitudes um, together with a, an interest in narrative, but a different kind of narrative. We'll see a narrative that emerges from different uh, unexpected uh, places. It's a cinema that from the very beginning, beginning with his first film, uh, Donde Están Sus Historias, which was a film made as his thesis film at York University in Toronto, where uh, Pereda, although he's from Mexico, was studied in Canada and, and divides his time between Canada and, and Mexico. But right from that very first film, we saw the emergence of a really fully formed style and sensibility. And it's one that continued across his early films. This is a film then that looks at, the, asks questions about uh, performance, about presence, about representation. Um, I should point out that Pereda has worked, um, continues to work with the same group of actors. And, and with this film, Los Mejores Temas, he said he declared an end to this kind of cinema and said that he was going on to other things, which we'll, I guess we'll, we'll be hearing more about. Uh, and these actors, Gavino uh, Rodriguez and Teresa uh, Sanchez, who often appear as mother and son, um, their presence in all of the films makes us think of uh, Pereira's films as kind of variations of a similar theme, right? And, and they, they sort of fit together like interlocking pieces. And with this film, he's trying to sort of rearrange those pieces. And in fact, in the film itself, it breaks in half. And we see actors even roles uh, uh, changing and dropping out, uh, and a kind of Bunuelian mirror being inserted into the film. Um, I think it's a wonderful film to, uh, for, to speak about, and I'm so happy we'll have a brief conversation after this with Albert Seda and with Tomita Katsia, who is also here. So now please join me in welcoming Nicolas Pereda. Thank you uh, for coming. Uh, uh, thank you so much for bringing us here, and thanks for that introduction. I have very little to say about the film after that, but um, I'll repeat a, little, a few things that you just said. No, it, because I made a, a bunch of films with the same people, and this film is a reflection on that, and the title of the film, I like it in English. Uh, this is sort of the first title that I like more in English than in Spanish, because Greatest Hits has this sort of, uh, you know, it's kind of like a phrase that's already made. Um, in, it's always seen as this kind of like retrospective of rock bands and I like the title because it referred to so, so it's a way for me to uh, focus on everything that I had done and and looked at it from a different from a, kind of a different perspective and even though it was a very formalist film I tried to make a formalist film to be as organic as possible so that the artifice because it was a very artificial film in some ways, uh, could disappear through sort of something organic. And I think that that was my attempt sort of in the second half of the movie. But anyway, uh, we'll talk more afterwards. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. We are doing a different presentation today because we have with us Agnes Wildenstein. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, in fact, she wo it was she who presented uh, Katsuya's, Tomita Katsuya's work for the first time in Locarno. And uh, it's a pleasure for me that she introduces the film. Thank you. So um, I will try to be brief because the movie is quite long, which is uh, good. 
Um, yes, we discovered this uh, movie, the world premiere was in Locarno two years ago, Saudage by Tomita Katsuya. Um, if you know Japanese cinema, you will be very amazed to see this movie because uh, it doesn't look like classical uh, Japanese movies. It's a very new, modern way to look at a Japanese reality. It's very interesting in that sense, but also in a cinematic sense. It's a very, very new and interesting movie with a lot of rhythm, so you won't be bored, I'm sure. But uh, please, now, I want uh, Tomita Katsuya to say a few words. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I cannot speak English. えっと、この映画はあの、ま、かつて皆さん日本のイメージがどのようなイメージかわかりませんが、あの、経済大国と言われた日本の経済があの、非常にあの、ダウンしまして、え、そのあの、ある地方都市、そんな状況の地方都市
実際にあそこをベースにして活動している本物のヒップホップグループです。あとやはりそのブラジル人たちの,あのコミュニティにこに遊びに行ってあの一緒に彼らと一緒にいるとあのもう自然に彼らの,あの周りに音楽が溢れてったんですそれとあのやはり日本の皆さんご存知かどうかあの日本独特の,あのカラオケという文化あのお酒飲みながら歌う歌うなのでそのなんか僕があの意図してあの音楽をなんだろう入れたというよりも自然に。自然発生的にあのああいう音楽がたくさん溢れる映画になったと思います。And at the same time, music has a type of dream quality to it.、Uh, 夢みたいのの,の dimension もありますね。You can get the sense of being inside characters' heads. So it's a it's a type of subjectivity that we get from the music. The scene where the where they're smoking the marijuana. The, the dream of Thailand that we see with, that we see at the end as well. So this is m a s a n i That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's then, then let's speak a bit more then about how you worked then with these these non non actors, right? These you know the, the musicians, for instance, and many of the other, and especially you know the、uh, um, you know these the, the Brazilian the members of the Brazilian community because you you're creating a portrait of a larger community. In these cases, rather than just individuals, it seems it, and many times you're working, you know,、um, I think with quite challenging situations. And so I was wondering if you could speak about your work with the non actors. まあこのこの映画の舞台になったところはあの前にも言いましたけど僕の出身地である山梨県甲府市というところです。で僕はあの高校を卒業してあの18歳の時にもすぐあの東京に出てしまいました。それであのまあ、そこから映画を作るようになっていくんですけれどもあのこの映画を撮ろうと思った時にやはりそ,のそれだけ自分の故郷を長い間離れてたからあのもう一度一からちゃんとあの自分の故郷ではあるけれどもきちんと全ていろんなことを知りたいと思って1年間あのリサーチをしましたであのその時に撮りためたあの膨大なあのビデオテープの素材があ,のあるんですけどそれをあのまとめたドキュメンタリーもあの別に実はありますそれであのそのリサーチしていく中であのとにかくいろんな人にカメラを持って話を聞いていくというスタイルを取ったんですけれども自然とあのブラジル人たちの,あの大きなコミュニティがあるというところをあの僕も改めてあの知ることになってそこから彼らのコミュニティに入り込んでいだからそれもあの僕が意図して入れたというよりはやっぱり自然な形であのこの映画の中に入ってきたことです。I'd like to ask you、uh, about、uh, politics and political cinema. And maybe we could start with、uh, this idea that is so profound in your film of uprootedness and of the, the, the dreams of uprootedness. The dreams of Tokyo, the dreams of、uh, Thailand, the dreams of Mane,、uh, the dreams of paradise.、Uh, ah. 非常に難しい質問です。It's a difficult question. <笑>あうんやはりあのまあじゃあ説明します。あの僕らがあの生きている以上あのやはり政治的なものあらゆるものは政治的だと僕は思っています。すべての生活のいろいろなものがあらゆるものがあの政治的だと思っています。そこから逃れることはあのできないと。思ってますあのなので何て言うんでしょうその例えばそこにいる実際に住んでいる人たちのことをテーマにあの映画をあの撮ろうというふうに思って、えー、撮っていくとあの必然的にそこで起こっていることがあの、まあ、こういう映画になったわけですけれどもあのやはり全てあのどこかであのそういうものと政治的なものとつながっているからこういう映画に、えー、なったと思っています。そうですね。その実際に住んでいる人々の。Um, okay, thank you.、Um, I would like、uh, today you've seen、uh, maybe I don't know if you stayed at the two screenings, but today we saw two movies dealing、uh, very strongly with reality in different ways.、Uh, in yeah, in very different ways, but dealing with reality. So I would like to know, Nicola.、Uh, 
maybe you could tell what you thought about Saudage and then maybe Tomita could tell us what he thought about the greatest hits to begin with. Okay, so more than, than the entire film, because it will take too long, I'll talk a bit of the things that interest me the most. And I think it's a, what's interesting about the film is that it's accumulative. It's not a film that the structure, that it's... Um, you're, it feels like you're seeing, and, and this is related to this idea of reality, that you're looking at uh, very similar scenes over, you know, throughout the film, you know, some construction problem, and then later, maybe an hour later, another construction problem. But what's interesting for me in this film is that the feeling that you have, and it's kind of difficult to talk about, but the feeling that you have the second or third time that you see the construction um, is very different than the first one, and, and the same as the karaoke bar, and the same as uh, relationship problems. And I, see, I, I think that's the strength of the film, that um, it doesn't rely on some, uh, kind of a... Um, the best way to say it for me is maybe a screenwriting devices in order for you to be engaged with the scene, but it just it sort of through the effect of this accumulative effect makes us be more sort of tied with reality. Um, so... Even though, obviously, there are some, let's say, cause and effect moments, and there are, uh, uh, you know, some relationships that do change over time, the strength of the film is, is, is the opposite, in a way, the fact that, it's, uh, that, that we're looking at, uh, at very similar things happening uh, over and over again. And also, I was just thinking now about it, that... There is a moment when I thought that that there was some randomness that maybe uh, the the we we're talking outside maybe that the fifth reel or the fourth reel could be the second and vice versa, but that's very speculative because uh, because I didn't watch the film in a different order. But the feeling that you get is that you could watch it in a different order and would have the same strength. But I don't know if if that's the case. It's no, I don't think so. But I, I don't think so. But I, I, I don't think I don't think it's true of your but, film either. But but uh, but, uh, but maybe not. Maybe there, there there is a very concrete way that you put the film together that is not necessarily um, random. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I might just actually say I relate this actually to Albert Seda's film, where I feel like one of the things that you capture, in a certain sense, to me, it feels almost like. A you capture the, the time's passage, the way in which people, you know, we're just speaking about like in Casanova's time, the ways in which there was a type of, 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 of characters sort of luxuriating, I mean, of just allowing these sort of longer pauses, allowing, you know, that's not the sense of sort of rushed, you know, nine to five, like, you know, time, or like this is no separation between work and leisure, between pleasure and, and uh, you know, and I, so I, I feel like there's a similar sense, you know, about time sort of, building cumulatively where things seem to repeat and then take on, right, and they get a sense of, of a sort of deeper time, the time of the construction workers too. I was actually going to say that the films couldn't be different in some ways, like they're like completely different films, but there are some things that tie them in, but, you know, but they're like sort of more general ideas and I think more or less that's, you know, what you touched upon is, is, is true. Hi. あの、まさに僕もその通りだと思います。あの、彼の映画とあの非常にその撮り方、あのスタイルは多分おそらく現場で撮影現場でやってることはかなり近いことをやってるような気がします。そう、あの、だから、あの、現場でやってることは非常に
to try to find some humoristic or some a little bit subversive moment, you know, that you are, like in my case, uh, if I found some similarities with that way of working that you are expecting, you know, when, where can you find a beautiful dialogue, original dialogue, or that the actor will make uh, something that it's unexpected and funny and that will broke, you know, this, uh, I don't know if it's ironical, but that will broke this... Uh, perception, this direct perception of reality. And in your films, there is a lot of that because there is sometimes even that people is, you know, dealing directly uh, with the uh, out of, uh, out of uh, sham, or this, uh, yeah, out of shot, you know, that it's, and yeah, so I don't know, it's, it's quite humoristic also because you do not expect it. And even when they, they, they are as, uh, laughing about their own, Acting, I, I I understood. No, there is moments. That, so there is always these two uh, liars or these two degrees when they are even. You know, <laughs> you feel that you, they are not playing. That they are, you know, uh, they are playing, but playing uh, about his play. You know, and uh, I don't know. It's interesting, and uh, I would ask you. Would love to ask you. Um, uh, how 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 important is humor and this subversive side of humor in your films and cinema? But be, yeah, humor is uh, sort of key in general. But the in this particular film, because it was such a formal film, I wanted to be able to use those formal devices for humor as well. So um, I knew that the, it was a film about representation and issues about the actor or the character and who, who is it that we're looking at. So I liked for the moments when Gavino plays the father, for example, that you know he goes back and forth, even though it's uh, the the first idea for it was uh, maybe a formal idea to talk about these issues. Um, I think uh, the nicest way to do it for me was to make it funny, because uh, because I take the issue seriously, but I think there has to, for me, there has to be sort of a kind of a, a combination of, I don't want to be too solemn with these ideas. And so I want them to, to be able to flow. It's the same thing with the, the, when the second father comes, it's a very sort of, uh, uh, you, you break, the I break the narrative so strongly and, uh, you get confused, you don't know what you're watching, but at least it's funny. So the, the guy is funny, he says funny things, and so that helps you sort of engage, I mean, at, I hope, engage a bit with the film, and then through the fact that you're engaged through comedy, then you might start thinking about all the other elements. Uh, because a film like this could be incredibly dense, because it's, uh, because it's full of formal games. Uh, uh, yeah, so comedy is, is essential in that sense. And then there is a lot of comedy that's not, uh, that's very m much sort of straightforward, I guess, but also comes from very, you know, uh, absurd, like very common, normal scenarios, you know, like, or someone makes a joke even, like uh, when the girlfriend tells him that she's pregnant and and then he gets excited and, and she, she says she's not pregnant. Um, no, because in your, in Perpetuum Mobile, uh, your other film, it's also very important and it's one of the key points of the whole film, the quality of the whole film. I think that it's, it's well, it's based on humor and, and the elegance of humor there. So, because it's, what I, it's really beautiful because it's humor but elegant. I mean, it's never, uh, never, you know, I don't know, it's very, I don't know how to explain, but... It's, it's like if it falls, you know, by spontaneously, it never looks pretentious, the, the humor, you know? I, I rely a point. lot on the actors. Yeah, so yeah it's linked with this kind of actor and the beauty of the, that they already have. And the them. humor would be very different with different actors. And yeah. that, so I don't push the humor, I write really dry screenplays. And so uh, with Gavino and uh, Teresa, they, uh, yeah, they, it has to be a level of spontaneity and uh, just set up an environment where humor can happen. Mm -hmm. It seems that a lot, of t a lot of times in the film, the actors are sort of challenging each other to perform. Yeah. You know, they're saying, you know, for instance, to the, f the father, the two fathers, you know, give, you know, for forgive, I mean, ask for forgiveness. 
apologize, you know, get on your knees. And it seems that they're pushing, like humor marks this kind of limit point of where, they, where they're sort of cha- daring each other to go. And we have this even when your intervention, when you ask suddenly, you know, how did your mother die? And it seems like there's almost a strained like, moment where, you know, incredulousness, where they almost seem to be laughing or where, where Luisa says she's pregnant too. It's, it's sense- a bit about putting people on the spot, the mm-hmm. film as well, to like now act, you know, because... It, all, a lot of these situations are not situations where you can sort of behave normally. You have to create, uh, have a character. It's like, um, even in that example when Luisa says, I'm pregnant, the reaction that Gavino has to have has to be acted, let's say. He, you know, it's putting the actor on the spot. And so some things are, you know, rehearsed in that sense. And some things are not like when I asked them about Gavino's dead mother. Um, that's like a very documentary moment, but it still is odd for them because of the situation we're in, because we're making a movie and I'm asking them outrageous things. So there's an element of comedy to me there as well. But it's true that the materiality of humor comes from actors because some of the jokes, if you explain or if you, you know, you'll read it in paper, it's nothing, it's stupid even. But the way they perform, you know, the, with the faces, with the, you know, this is what it really gives the quality. And I think it's it's beautiful. And in the opposite, perhaps I don't know if culturally it's more difficult for me. But uh, in 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 his film, there is no humor. You know, it's like, a, or I feel there is no humor. It's quite a direct and depressing reality. There is no escape to the to the. You know, I don't know if it's true or if it's uh, you know if uh, it's. Ah. そうですか。あの、僕はあの、非常にその、え、いわゆる人々が人間が生きていることの、あの、ステレオタイプな、あの、エピソードを、あの、コミカルに、あの、やったつもりです。あの、要するにその、<笑><笑><笑> <あの>、<笑> <あの、笑> <笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> この I, I think you both your movies have in common that uh, well you said that a bit and uh, I, we discussed that earlier with Nicholas that they 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 were built uh, themselves and you you well you've been di- directing and making them through a quite a long period of time in a very organic and fragmented way uh, I think it's um, the case for you uh, uh, but also that you and Nicholas did um, the, the two parts uh, in a separate way um, at two s- separate periods of time. And that um, when you did the first uh, part, you, it was not clear for you that the, there were, would be the second one. And so I, I, I guess that um, the, the fact you, you both of you worked in such a way um, creates some echoes between the two movies, but what I'm interested in is how different they are on s- aspects that could have been so close to each other, considering the way you you did them in uh, some with s- th- this uh, this Im- improvisation component to it, and with all this amount of time and this organic way to 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 make the the movie. Uh, Evolve with, I guess, less of an agenda like you had, even if you allow yourself a lot of uh, freedom in the, especially in the editing, I guess, in the way you work with with the actors. But so what, what I'm interested in is that the so that is is very straightforward. Uh, it produces uh, quite a straightforward reality in in many ways. Also, what I what I like very much about your film, Nicholas, is that. Um, this idea that is very well expressed by the um, the litany of of the song titles, for example, which is which produces some kind of collage uh, texts, very sentimental. Uh, also, um, there is nothing, almost nothing, sentimental in in the relationship of of the the characters. For example, it's it allows some, it liberates also, it frees something 
that is uh, that seems very hidden and 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 um, uh, um, and uh, tied between the characters, and it's this kind of the same when um, when you, and you talked a bit about that earlier that uh, when uh, characters ask themselves to um, to actually act like uh, in this scene I like very much when the, the mother like asks her son to to uh, to play her his father to to rehearse a, a scene where she would talk to the father, but actually she's talking to him, which seems impossible in any other scene, in, a, in that way at least. So it's always like, um, if there's, um, it's a bit like you, you always, they always need a detour, um, an intercessor for things to happen or to get said. And I feel like uh, it's uh, quite similar to the, the, the form the movie found in, uh, in, your, in your process. Be, because I filmed first the first part and the second part I hadn't thought about it and later it was like I came to it it's, it's similar to the way the film actually works within it in some ways maybe yeah I'd never thought of that yeah it's possible it's uh, yeah <laughs> I don't know yeah it could be it's interesting yeah I, I guess I, I just wanted to say before that um, I, I actually found Shodali not only a very funny film but um, a very hopeful film in, in a strange way. Um, the, there's an expression that's used uh, twice in the film. I don't know if it's the same in Japanese. And it's this idea, we need to speak face to face with each other. And, and the first time it comes up is with this politician. And of course he says, we have to speak face to face. And then he just says everything you would expect a politician to say. It's like the scene from Taxi Driver with the uh, politician who comes into the taxi, which I was thinking about because you had a taxi driver shirt. Sure on yesterday. The second time it comes up, I forget who the character is, but they're talking about virtual reality. And they're saying everything is mediated through computers and through cell phones. Um, but what we need to have now is a face-to-face -face encounter where we can actually speak to each other. Um, and at the end of it, it comes down to this face-to-face. -face. And all, all throughout the film, we're watching people perform. Um, not just musical performances, but even um, everyday activities, um, the way in which they have to act with one another and uh, always moving, or they're walking, they're doing something. They're not staying still, they're not sitting around. There, there's always a performance. Um, but at the very, very end, we finally get this face-to-face -face shot with, um, with the, the killer. And it's, 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 it's amazing because it's the first time I think we've really stuck with somebody as they've stayed in a place, which is, of course, what we've seen in the, the past two films um, quite a bit. Um, but what for me, what for me is, uh, I think, hopeful about both this, uh, the film we watched earlier today uh, by Nicolas, is, is this idea that you, you, you can have a face-to-face -face encounter, not just of filming these people who are just hanging out with each other, they're not on their cell phones, they're talking to each other, which, um, as somebody who lives in New York, is impossible to see. I, I, I can only see it in these movies. Um, but, but also that that's the idea of the filmmaking, uh, that it's the director comes and he wants to have a face-to-face -face encounter in which he's producing something, but the actor is also producing something. Uh, so, so yesterday we, we talked a, a little bit about Warhol, and if it's okay to bring this, I guess, to old movies. Um, the, the director I was thinking about a lot today uh, was Jean Rouge. Um, and in Jean Rouge's films, I guess you could say in, in Warhol's films, he starts with the fiction. He starts with uh, the pop and the characters and Tarzan and, and, and these absolutely mythic... Um, iconography. And then he, he brings it to such a spectacular point that it becomes a documentary again, uh, where, where he brings it down. Even, even in the, the very opposite films, like the portrait films or Empire or something, uh, there, there's so little going on that there, there's a lot going on. You're, you're suddenly brought back to the performance of these, these people sitting there and acting. Um, with Rouge, I think it works the opposite way. And this is something I was thinking about today. Uh, that when we have the Rouge films, he, he starts off... Um, from documentary where he says, these are my friends, these are the people I know, and then he turns it into fiction uh, because he takes them and he has them uh, create their own scenes to act out. And, and so I think maybe these are two different ways where the, the, the film yesterday is very much like a Warhol film. It starts with a fiction and then it brings it to a documentary. But the films today uh, start with a documentary and um, they, they bring it to, uh, to a fiction. So. Because we have to put it in Japanese. So, so the, the, the question is uh, of the, between documentary and fiction. Uh, maybe we could have the both directors commenting on, on document. This is mainly a question for Hayden. 
Uh, all I wanted to say is I, I'd, I'd actually like to hear Hayden, Hayden's thought on this because th this weekend is called After, after Vonda um, and it's talking about a different turning point, not, not Roosh and not Warhol, but uh, Pedro Costa's in Vonda's room. And I'm, I'm curious how, how we can maybe bring this back to uh, all these films together with uh, the phantom presence of, uh, in Vonda's room. Yeah, no, in Vonda's room is the, is the sort of the thing that ties all of these films together in the sense of in Vonda's room is offering a kind of map a, a potential of, of possible futures for the cinema in the year 2000. Here we're looking at four, three, and four on Sunday. Different, um, I think, visions, visionary filmmakers who fulfilled the promise of that that's stated in that film, but in radically different ways, in ways that are completely um, their own. And I think simil the, a similar question of, uh, in Costa's film, the question about uh, documentary and reality is... is and documentary and narrative um, cinema and the sort of urgent need to reject the sort of uh, the categorization, the easy categorization of these two um, cinemas, I think is, is something that's embraced by all these filmmakers in different ways. Um, and so I think this is, this is, I mean, I think, and this is a sort of open question too then, yes, is um, thinking about Saudad, thinking about the films we're going to see. In what ways do you think of these, of your films, as documentaries? あの、ちょっと作り方をあの特徴、まあ、皆さんそうなのかもしれないけど、ちょっと作り方を言います。あの、実際彼らはあの僕らの友人であり、え、まあ、あそこで実際に生活している人々だということは言いましたけれども、プ
the things he would be doing. But he is pretending that the, that Gavino is his biological son and that he has an ex-wife and that he has this life. And so there is like a you know a fictional sort of uh, veil into his into that world. And um, and Gavino throughout the films also is just my friend at the same time. I cast him because I, because he has this ability for humor because he. Uh, in real life, not in acting, not in films, and because of the way he moves, because of his face, because of, let's say, documentary elements are what I'm interested in him. And so, yeah, like, and uh, this division is complicated in that sense. It's not, it's not that I start with one world of fiction that turns into documentary, documentary into fiction. It's more that... Um, if we think of those genres as just being cinematographic tools, then I just grab a bit of tools from from both worlds, and then I, I you know, I use them at the same time. Because for me, at, at the same time, every image, at the same time, it's a documentary and a fiction. You know, when you see, for example, Casablanca, you see, I don't know, this guy, uh, this character, this role, Rick, saying, I don't know what, no? And, but at the same time, the same image is a documentary about Humphrey Walker, you know, uh, playing a role and saying the, that sentence, you know. Uh, so the, there is these two layers, it's the same image, that usually they tend to be uh, tautologic, no? It's, it, it's completely... But uh, sometimes, like in your films, or I try in my films also, you know, there is a dialectic, a small dialectic fight between these two. And in the same image, it's not perfectly tautological, you know. There is a, a small uh, difference. And because it's the way, perhaps, it's due to the way, uh, and you get a little bit confused sometimes, because it's due to the way, at least with me, the way I work. Because when I work with, uh, when, I, when I shoot with people, I, I always uh, think in terms of documentary. I never think about the role. I never, you know, I am just there looking at the, the face or I want him to do, to do or to say something, but, you know, as, as a materiality, I never think in terms of the meaning of the role. This is all, this will arrive later or, you know, it's already there. You cannot avoid, you cannot escape a role because, you know, the power of illusion, of image always creates a fiction because it will never be reality, you know, it's an image, it's two dimensions, so it's an illusion of reality. So I think that in my case, at least, uh, fiction arrives later, but the way I work, it's strictly uh, documentary and sometimes in the final image, as it's so powerful, these two sides, in the sense that because it's historical ambience, blah blah blah, and you know the fictional side, it's quite powerful already uh, for, from the be from the beginning. But then with this absolutely, you know, documentary focus way of working, uh, then there is this small gap, and it's what creates so many stability that it's uh, beautiful and it in your film and obviously exists also. I, I like this thing that you said that it's like a, the dialectic of the being on the screen. Because I think that you could, uh, I mean, something should be written about that, I think. There is, a, there is an, a, an image that is two-dimensional, as you say, but there is a dialectic between the person that you're watching and the actor or the character. Yeah. Uh. No, but I think it's quite remarkable, and your movie is, is quite a, a good example of a lot of um, directors who now represent this tendency to, of... Um, not only melting documentary and fiction uh, at the very beginning, well, at the very cement of their work, but all, also uh, taking for granted that actually we 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 see more and more movies for for quite a while actually who do precisely that in a way that makes the, the well the the opposition between documentary and fiction almost meaningless and all the, well this kind of debate also, in a way, uh, because it's so um, organically and deeply part of the, 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 the gesture of uh, many di directors um, today that, and for, for a few years now, I guess, that uh, it, it produces, and that's what I wanted to say, movies like yours that invent, well, almost feel the need to invent their own rules or their own language to for to to put well um, to to reinvent this distinction or to to create a, um, to distribute fiction and documentary share in their own way. 
And just to add, in, in Portugal too, they do that. I mean, uh, speaking about uh, Miguel Gomes or Pedro Rodriguez and Jorge Guida Mata, they, they play with that too. I, I so, we, just to uh, finish on about that, I, I was of, um, obviously thinking of um, of Miguel Gomes, for example, and uh, his um, uh, Cher Madut, uh, I don't know the, the English title of it. Uh, no, the... the uh, um, the, um, oh, my beloved man. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. and so um, f there, there is two parts in his movie, for example, which is one is well stands for documentary, and the other one for fiction. And um, we we know that none of them are exactly one or the other, but the movie states that one is, and the other um, is the other thing. And it's it's kind of well a way for movies just to to invent was well, this way to invent their own frontier for the two genres, if I may say. I mean, and we have also in this program from the begin from the very beginning have been tracing this tension between documentary and narrative in film earlier films of Portugal, of course, in Antonio Reis and the Paulo Rocha. You know, so it's, it works. I think it's it's very it's clear like that core. this is one of the most important through lines. And if we add to that. You know, Rite of Spring by Manuel de Oliveira, I think it's clear that this is one of the sort of signatures, the most important through lines, I think, of, of the Portuguese cinema, for sure. Of Art de Primavera, etc. But the other idea of these dialogues is to have the, the luxury of the audience asking questions to the directors. So, Especially those who have been uh, so patient. <laughs> if we have if any anyone wants to make a question, it will be... Audience? We have these distinguished directors. Ah, here we go. Right here. Thank you so much for your films. I think it's just been a real privilege to watch all three films. Um, my question is, um, just watching your films and, and thinking about it and, and listening to the conversation is that, is there, I mean, in your opinion, the, the you know, three filmmakers, that um, there is something inherently limiting about narrative film? A narrative structure that, that you feel that um, just sticking to that kind of you know a narrative, uh, uh, however unconventional it is, still remaining within the structure. I mean, I guess you know um, about uh, uh, the the film we saw yesterday. Maybe is is uh, kind of closest to that in a way, but then you know it, it sort of breaks very radically. And I think that I, I wonder, you know, if this desire to go beyond the narrative, you know, where, where it comes from. And then maybe you can talk about the other way where um, if you're sticking to the strictly documentary, quote unquote, a nonfiction world of, of the type, you know, like um, in, in, in your hometown, um, Tommy Sang. And, and, you know, uh, uh, Nicolas, uh, you, you're sort of the actors that you work with, or the actors that you work with. What's limiting about that world, you know, that the, why is this imagination or fiction, kind of a fictional world necessary to actually make up, uh, you know, the kind of a, a filmic world that, you, that you're creating? Does this, does this make sense? I don't know. It's very difficult to question. It's very difficult. I don't know if it's there is something inherent, inherently limiting in the narrative, simply narrative films. Could be. I don't know. Uh, perhaps it's for me. In my case, it was simply boring. Uh, to, yeah. I mean, I don't know. You don't have the desire to do it because it's you have to work too much and you have to consider a lot of things that I don't want to consider because you know other part or other performatic. You know, parts of the film are more interesting for me, not uh, not aesthetically, but uh, just personally. You know, so it was a, a ridiculous answer, but uh, I don't know. But if I don't know if I consider more deeply, obviously I think that these films that uh, are more linked with what he was saying with uh, Jean Rouge or uh, Warhol, or you know, add something that the other films, simply pure narrative film, will never have. So. Uh, and they still have the narrative, so in some sense, they, they, I think that they do not lose a lot, and they can uh, get more, you know. But they can get uh, 
So I think that it's uh, it's a, a balance that it's it's more interesting for this kind of films nowadays. And it's you know it, because if not, it will be all uh, all arts made this uh, this uh, this way. I mean, contemporary art or even literature or you know, nobody stay on the 19th century narrative. You no, know? and only cinema. Uh, and I think that our we are working in trying to, to discover new forms of language. And for the other question of working only with these actors, I don't know. For me now the real challenge would be to mix all these actors or a lot of these actors with one really iconic professional actor and look what happens in this mix. But it's like, a, it's very difficult. I think all the, or almost all the people who tried made the worst films. <laughs> in a certain sense, so, your act, your non-actors have yeah. become actors by the time they've. No, they've. they've, they've I they've always answer that they are so stupid that <laughs> they will, they will never arrive to this point, you know. And it's part of his innocence because I, it's it's almost it's, innocent. It, yeah, it's it's surprising for me to see how 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 I don't know how even now they cannot understand really. <laughs> Or if perhaps it's the challenge of the filmmaker also the, that really push things in a very, you know, close, close and fictional and very, you know, in a, in a world that it's very difficult to escape and to consider other things because it's a, some kind of immersion, very deeply immersion on, in, on what you are doing and then you even forget what you were doing, you know, two years ago. But I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. It's... But I think it's due to the the way filmmaker work. The filmmaker works, not so much to the to the the, the capacity of the actors or non capacity or you know the filmmaker is always uh, always you know arrives to a, some point that he, he wants to arrive. Yeah. So, but the first question I think the problem is the question assumes that there is either one or the other or a negation of narrative and I think you touched upon that a little bit and I think it's a, it's a problem of hierarchy that yeah. in a certain kind of filmmaking storytelling or narrative or you call it, it's like at the top all the tools of filmmaking are strictly directed towards that and nothing else and whatever doesn't fit that mode that hierarchical mode then gets sort of left behind and I think it's not the rejection of Storytelling is a rejection of the hierarchy. So sometimes storytelling is important, and then many elements go towards it. But many other times we bring storytelling, you know, further down in that hierarchy, and maybe we're interested in something else. But we still keep story there, or maybe not. Maybe at some point we leave it aside. But it's 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 more looking at at this um, at story in a sort of similar playing field, uh, hierarchically uh, speaking as many other elements, like acting or like, uh, like whatever, uh, color, light, whatever. But I think that in, in your film, there is a clear rejection of narrative, because there is other films that they do not reject narrative, but they go towards uh, abstraction. But it's quite common in cinema nowadays that, you know, narrative is disappearing because abstraction appears. But in your film, you know, there is a clear fight against the Russian. You see, for example, in the first part, the scene where he, 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 the, the, the father asks to join in this new business, and you repeat the scene, you know, you make the scene twice, because almost, you know, it's almost exactly, and you start and you see, what I am seeing, it's exactly the same dialogue or no? I mean, it's a clear disturbing proposal and disturbing the... the the, you understand what yes, I mean? Yes, there is yeah, a, no, but and I, when you put two fathers and you don't understand exactly why there is two fathers, you know, or if it's really, w w what's the point of two fathers? From the narrative, a strictly narrative point of view, you know, you get confused and it's a really a clear rejection of, of the logic of narrative. But not, th there is a difference between the rejection of something and the confrontation with it. And I think here is, is more confrontation because I use narrative to confront it and to create something at a dif different sense with it. So when they have the business proposal, that's a small narrative. And then when it repeats, then it's a rejection of the previous narrative, but you need narrative in order to talk about these things. So it's not the sort of no. the... Narrative is always there because when you put two images already, not necessarily. you know, it's, it creates. But, but I mean, but there is a level of storytelling. I mean, not every sort of film has, I mean, there's videos that you can have just really no storytelling where 
you know what I mean? Like without. Uh, um, I even felt that you had some pleasure on putting this narrative uh, f uh, for for itself because without the, the logical value that yes, has it's usually, you know, it's just uh, like a tale, a never-ending tale. Uh, like a artificial no, narrative, an empty narrative, just for the pleasure to do it. I mean, not not again, so just for the pleasure of of using it in a, in a very light way, in a yes, completely certain, light way. Yes, to a certain degree. Yes, I mean, I try to 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 keep an element of it by you know making the the a bit the story of the the difficulty be, being a single mother and having a father come back, which is narrative, you know, and uh, and the. Uh, and trying to deal with, with that situation. What I mean is that even though the narrative is kind of an excuse to a certain degree, I still care about the, that. If I'm going to write you know, two lines of narrative, I'm hoping that those two lines are things that I do care about. It's just two lines, but I care about them. I feel like you know, family melodrama is this kind of urtext of your films that you I mean, so you, within, and you offer us like the smallest constitutive units of the melodrama, you know, the, the father. And you, you do this in many of your films, but you've, you've sort of broken that apart and then you just give us these little like shards or fragments of the narrative. And I think, you know, in your case, Albert, you know, you're dealing with these uber texts that have been written already, have been told already. So I feel like in, the, in that way, the way you deal with melodrama, the way you deal with canonical texts is, is, is a way that you interrogate or confront in a narrative. No, that in your film you would think that a big narrative element would be if, if I tell, if someone asks me what the film is about and I say, oh, it's how Dracula kills Casanova. And that's like a little bit in the film, but it's a huge ele narrative element, let's say, but when you watch it, it's not that you give it weight. Like you, you, I mean, there is more weight in Casanova taking a dump than <laughs> in Casanova getting killed by Dracula in the film. Because narrative is usually it's something that we, we can translate in words, mm -hmm. you know? And all other elements of the film, you know, when they are powerful, it's because you cannot translate it in words. So sometimes what remains, it's not, uh, you have to see it, you cannot uh, explain it. Yeah, so how powerful is, from the, you know, aesthetic point of view, you know, something you can translate on words or something you cannot translate, well, I think it's more powerful for something you cannot translate because it goes more in deep in the sense of cinema. So for this, this is another reason to reject a little bit, you know, the importance of uh, of, of narrative in, in cinema because, well, you can do it with words, why don't you write a book? あの、じゃあすいません。あの、ここであの、2人の会話とまた全く外れたことを言ってしまうかもしれませんが。あの、最初にサウダージを撮る前にリサーチをドキュメンタリー、あのリサーチのドキュメンタリーとして映像を撮ってたと先ほど言いましたが。で、そのそれを撮ってる時は現実に現実の起こってることをなんのこっちのディレクションも